Welcome to the Excellence in Full Denture Technology webinar being presented by Dennis Urban, CDT. He is VP of Education and Training here at Dental Services Group. All right. Thanks, Jessica. And thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, uh, after we finish tonight, you're going to be excited about denture technology. You know, it's, it's, it just brings to mind, I was talking to a, um, a clinician the other day who just recently graduated a few years ago, and he said he still has nightmares about doing his first denture, you know, and uh, and we're not going to make give you that experience tonight. We're going to give you a good experience. And, you know, um, you know, with all the great advances in denture technology the past few years with digital technology and material advances, we still have to remember that we need to apply the basics and understand the science of what is involved in making a denture. And uh, so tonight we're going to cover successful procedures and application for the final outcome of excellence in removable technology. So we're going to, get, we're going to get started. We have a lot of information. I'm going to cover everything from the, the basics of, um, uh, you know, from by registrations to custom trays, uh, processing, denture setups, occlusion, uh, workflow in the operatory, and what we need to do to communicate also. So let's get started. And I just, uh, Jessica told you about me, so I'm not going to elaborate too much more about that, but I, I've had the opportunity to travel worldwide uh, lecturing and learning and, and, um, and just uh, applying my skills and learning new skills on denture technology over the past 40 years. So I've been at this for a long time and it's my passion and um, I love what I do. And I try to get across the techniques and materials that I've used over the years to make it successful for, for clinicians and for patient acceptance. And that's what we're going to cover tonight. Going to make a simplified approach for you in the in the operatory, so you can uh, apply those those skills to your, your patients and for a final outcome of patient satisfaction. So let's get started. So as you see here on the screen here on the left hand side on, on top, uh, this is these are George Washington's dentures and they were made of lead and whalebone actually. And on the lower part we have uh, vulcanite dentures, which is a hardened rubber material back in the 50s and, and early 60s. So we've come a long way with materials, you know, over the years. You know, so uh, you know some of the new advancements in materials have been denture-based acrylics that have been more high impact resistance with flexural strength, more aesthetic. Uh, denture teeth now wear like natural dentition. We're going to talk about denture teeth a little later on too and what the best options are for choosing the denture teeth because there's a lot of choices out there. Uh, hybrid dentures, uh, we've seen it, the, the market for hybrid dentures and, and all on four, all on six type of cases. Uh, over denture cases, we've come a long way with attachment systems. Uh, so we've come, you know, we, you know, for a long time, denture technology was really pre pretty much stagnant. And uh, and Crown and Bridge was the, uh, the area that was just growing and having more advancements. And now, you know, you go to a trade show, you go watch webinars, everything is about dentures and removable technology from full dentures to uh, digital dentures to uh, implant dentures. So there's a lot of excitement out there in this market, you know, and even with partial denture materials, we come a long way. I'm gonna to touch a little bit on that tonight. I don't have too much time, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention a few things about partial denture materials too. So it's, these are some of the photos on, I'm showing on the screen, some of the dentures I've done with denture-based staining, characterization to mimic uh, the natural gingiva of a patient. We can do that, we have that technology. So, you know, we have, you're in the, you have a patient in the chair and, and you, you, know, you, you have an acrylic that you're using, which is not matching the patient's natural gingiva, we can do that for you. And we'll talk about that later on in, in the presentation with denture-based staining, as you can see here. So there's a lot of a uh, lot of applications we can utilize, even with uh, waxing up dentures. You know, this is one of my dentures to try ins with waxing up. I actually characterize this wax up uh, to mimic the patient's natural uh, uh, gingiva, and uh, we can do that on the denture try ins also. And then we all, what we do, we take a digital photo and we transfer that uh, that technique over to denture based staining. So uh, and even with mill bar design with over denture cases, we've come a long way with those types of cases. This is a full upper and full lower denture with uh, denture-based stain. This is a physio dense uh, Vita teeth. And look how nice and aesthetic that looks, beautiful. All on four, all on six, you know, it's, it's a growing market everywhere you look. And even with full zirconia restorations on, uh, on these types of full mouth restorations. And this is another one of my wax ups here. So we'll get into that uh, aspect later on when we talk about denture uh, setups and denture teeth and those types of things, so. And with partial denture technology, metal-free technology has come a long way with partial dentures. So, you know, we, patients want to wear a partial now that doesn't look like a, a denture. They don't want to see metal. They want something light and comfortable. We have those options now. We milled uh, partial dentures like this material. It's a super, super polymer called Save and Ultair. That's a great option for partial dentures also. And then you have clear technology to also with uh, clear partial frameworks. 
um, semi-flexibility. Some of them are rigid, uh, but the, the partials just actually disappear in the mouth and all you see is a natural look of the uh, uh, polyesthetic denture teeth. So a lot of options out there for on a removable end here. So uh, we're going to get into the uh, meat and potatoes here in a few minutes here. But um, also, I wanted to touch on digital technology. I know you've probably been hearing the buzzwords about digital technology, and uh, it's a growing, evolving field. And, and it's, uh, the technology is there, and it's growing every day as far as the, uh, the preciseness and, and, the, and the aesthetics and function of these types of dentures. This is a whole other seminar I do. I'm going to throw a couple of teasers in there, in there tonight about digital technology, digital denture technology. But you know, before you know, like I mentioned earlier, before you get to this technology, you really know the, need to know the basics and the science of what you're doing. So I have a couple of quotes here. You know, more people need dentures now than ever before. The industry predicts tremendous growth now through 2050. Experienced denture technicians are the guides for dentist and patient success in denture prosthesis. And this is a quote by uh, Dr. St Stephen Wagner, who's a prosthodontist, and he was very uh, innovative and, um, and instrumental in uh, helping develop um, materials for dense ply with a digital uh, printed denture. And I like this quote, this quote right here. This is from Dr. Christian, Christian Coachman, and he said this last year at the Seattle Study Group meeting. He said, professionals who understand dentures are the ones who understand smile design because you have to look at all the aspects of denture technology. You know, we have an intraocclusal space of about 40 millimeters. We have to fill with denture teeth on a fully edentulous patient. So we have to know anatomical landmarks. We have to know smile design. We have to know all the science behind occlusion. And uh, this is what I try to get across. And if you know all those aspects of it and you apply them in the right way, you're gonna have a successful denture patient, a successful and happy patient with successful cases. So digital and analog, I mentioned digital earlier, but you know, we, you know, we need to utilize the same fundamental prosthodontic processes to make a digital denture as we always have. You know, the clinician still needs to communicate and provide the technician with the necessary information for a functional case. And digital denture technology is still evolving and improving at a rapid pace, like I mentioned earlier. So it's constantly changing, you know, and the basic knowledge of prosthodontic principles, including providing accurate impressions is even more important in the digital world because many details can be seen on a large screen, which could not otherwise be detected. So, um, and you know, more importantly, dentists still need to understand that the importance of capturing accurate maxillomandibular records, vertical dimension and central relation, relation is essential. And technici technicians need to continue to analyze ridge relationships and then select appropriate anterior and posterior teeth of the desired occlusal scheme. So you still have to know that science, like I mentioned earlier. So, and that was, that was a quote by Dr. Stephen Wagner also. But I always, always try to stress the quality of materials and techniques. You know, it's a reflection of your talents and skills and it's gonna to yield to a successful case. So let's look at where we're gonna be in denture technology 20 years from now. And this, it, this encompasses some of the studies that have been done in the last uh, five years. And it's pretty interesting. I always say, wake up and smell the acrylic. Uh, you know, dental schools, manufacturers, dentists, and dental laboratories, they're becoming more aware of the growing removal business. There's a lot of opportunity out there on a removal side. And the last few decades produced a large number of graduating dentists with limited exposure to removable prosthodontics and compromised removable skill levels. And this is why we need communication throughout uh, the, the whole network. With, with us at the laboratory, with you in the dental office, we have to communicate and do case planning efficiently for a good outcome. And most students entering dental technology programs over the past 10 years have pursued crown and bridge skills instead of dentures. So, you know, it's, just, it's, a, it's a market where it's in big demand, but we still have shortage of uh, denture technicians out there. You know, so uh, I'm involved, I'm the chair of the National Board of Certification for, uh, national, for uh, it's called NBC in this, in this industry. And we're trying to entice new, uh, new young technicians into the field. And uh, we're seeing that, but uh, the majority of the technicians out in the field now are just mostly middle-aged or uh, and more are, try, are trying to come into the business, but uh, those real experienced technicians uh, are getting older, let's put it that way. So, so let's look at those aging technicians here. You know, we have uh, from 50 to 60 years old, it's about 21%. And you look at that 40 to 50 year old range, it's about 36% of those technicians. So we, we need to entice more technicians and that's our job at the National Board of Certification and NADL, National Association of Dental Laboratories, so we can fully communicate correctly and have a successful case. So, uh, uh, but more and more younger technicians are coming into the field. So I mentioned before, more income opportunities, Dental laboratories, DSOs, dentists, dental manufacturers, and the removable market is growing like crazy, it really is. So, 
And 52% of laboratories surveyed claim they had an increase in full dentures in the last five years. And these include replacement dentures, uh, existing dentures, more, uh, patients want more aesthetic dentures. They don't want to look like they're you know, wearing the, your grandfather's denture or your grandmother's denture. They want to look like they're not wearing a denture at all. And we have that capability now when, we, when we're making these dentures with the materials that are out there. So it's, it's pretty interesting and exciting what's going on in the denture field. You know? And dentists, this is one survey that was done by Lab Dental Products Report, uh, dentists who would like to increase their full denture business. It's only about 46%. And the reason being is because of the problems that, uh, that dentists incurred over the, over the years, they, they, you know, as far as chair time, uh, adjustments, uh, fit, fit, fitting not, uh, not being efficient, uh, and patients not being happy with their dentures. So in essence, you're married to the patient and because these dentures either weren't made correctly or the protocol wasn't there or the wrong materials were used. So we have to get that number up you know, uh, to give that comfort level to the clinicians out there in making dentures. And I believe it, it can be done. You know, there is a successful method of making a, a good uh, denture that's going to be uh, uh, provide patient satisfaction. And about 52% or 53% of labs surveyed claim that had then increased in partial denture cases in the last five years. And this includes, you know, not still metal, you know, metal for partials are still in demand, but this includes uh, flexible partials and those cosmetic type partials I, I talked about earlier. So what about the dentists who would like to increase their partial dentures? Well, it's a little bit more than the full dentures. It's about 65% because the surveys uh, produced uh, results that uh, was, were telling us that dentists felt like there were less uh, uh, chair side adjustments with, uh, with partial dentures than were, were with full dentures. So let's address communication between the dentist, the technician, and the patient. It's really important. And especially on implant cases, implant dentures, the, you know, the communication is key when you're doing these types of cases. So, so we have all these communication tools at our fingertips, but sometimes we just can't communicate effectively on planning a case. So, you know, we really have to meet those patient expectations, you know, and we have to talk to the patient. And I have a whole list, a checklist that you can uh, look at in a few minutes that we have to you know, really apply those, that checklist when you were interviewing the patient for a denture. And then the clinician and the technician have to get together and plan this case efficiently. So. Sometimes all we hear is noise. You know, the messages are, isn't there. You know, we, we talk back and forth and we don't have that communication. But I'm noticing more and more now, I, I see better communication in this industry, uh, in the dental industry that I've ever seen before between dentists and, and dental laboratories and dental technicians. So some of the fuzzy meanings I just throw up there, sometimes, usually, occasionally, frequently, quite often, now and then, and the five words we hate hearing the most in the laboratory is when we have a case and we're working on it and you, you, uh, the clinician calls us up and tells us, do the best you can. So I'm going to elaborate on that in a little while when it comes to impressions and occlusal records and things like that. Uh, sometimes we can't do the best we can, we can because you know what's going to happen? It's going to wind up being a remake. So we want to make sure we get all the correct information on the onset on these cases. And if we don't, we'll call you up and we'll get, we'll get it done correctly and we'll start it from the beginning. You know, I always tell the technicians in the laboratory, you know, if you see something, say something, stop the case, and let's get the correct information for a successful case. Because you're the ones in front of the patients, and this is, this. You know, I, I don't envy you sometimes when you have to uh, deal with the patients when there's not a successful case. So uh, communication is key. So we, be, we depend on you for your clinical knowledge and training and the assessment of the patient, appropriate treatment planning, Detailed information on ERX, that's, that's really important. You know, uh, instead of just saying set up shade 62 or uh, A2, whatever, uh, we really like a detail, detailed information uh, on the patient. Maybe add digital photography in with that. Give us uh, some, uh, some history of how the patient's occlusion was. Maybe they had trouble with their occlusion or sore spots, an unstable denture. Maybe they can't tolerate a, a full denture. Maybe they have to go with an implant uh, over denture case. So all these things we have to look at, and also we have to look at the correct materials. And the communication with us as certified dental technicians, you depend on our expertise and knowledge on procedures and materials, the appropriate feedback to you on impressions, bites, shades, et cetera. And I think still the number one call we make to uh, clinicians uh, all throughout the, uh, our, our network, not only, I'm not just, I'm not singling out the Heartland, but all around our, our account network is on impressions. So uh, it's important we get the correct information. And we want to do case planning with dentists and, and you, and there's an implant case also with the oral surgeon and periodontist. So and we always depend on the digital photography. It's nice to have that photography with us uh, when we have the case at the bench. 
because if we have the proper materials, including an articulator and digital photography, it's almost like having the patient at the bench with us. And we need that information. So, and we give you advice on proper case planning and materials. So communication is key for a successful case. So at DSG, we keep in mind patient satisfaction. We want to look beyond the articulation, we want to make each case a positive new adventure, and we show our expertise in all our work. And uh, it's, it's amazing with the majority of dentures we do at DSG and successful dentures, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. And the main focus is on patient acceptance. We want to have that patient acceptance because if you don't have that patient accept acceptance, you're in trouble and we're in trouble at the laboratory. So I stress utilizing all the right tools and the science of, uh, of successful dentures. So, so let's get uh, into the clinical pro protocol for removals now. We're going to go through each protocol and elaborate more on each one, you know, and uh, from the first visit with the preliminary impression, second visit with a custom tray final impression, third visit, occlusal uh, registration, bite registration, and then the fourth visit with the tooth setup and wax trying, and the final visit with the final insertion of the denture. And uh, you could probably cut out one visit if you, uh, it could be eliminated if a functional impression is taken inside the occlusal rim base plate. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And the bite registration is taken at the same time in that uh, occlusal rim uh, base plate at the second visit. So you can do an impression and a bite registration in one shot. And if you have an existing denture, you can also do that. You know, can take an impression, a wash impression, the existing denture, take a new bite registration, and we can work from there. And that's going to save save you uh, a, a, a visit in uh, in, the, in the operatory there. So, so let's look at the exam check checklist here. I like to give this to our clinicians here. It's a great checklist, and um, you know, I know you know, I. I, I when I first saw this checklist, uh, I had some of these uh, these items on my checklist, but uh, I actually went to a Dawson Academy uh, seminar and they had the same, some of the same items on here and I elaborated more by taking some of the items they had on there and they, they look at the physiological factors of a patient, you know, whether they had problems with the occlusion, what type of occlusal scheme it was, uh, um, maybe they couldn't tolerate certain aspects of a denture, uh, maybe allergic to the denture base, um, some of the anatomical factors, Maybe the um, the uh, degree of cuspal inclination of the of the teeth weren't correct. Maybe they had to go with a different occlusal scheme. Maybe a lingualized occlusion um, and functional factors also. You know, so you look at all these factors, and of course, one of the most important factors also is aesthetic factors. But you know, if you have aesthetics and you don't have function, then it's it's a failure. So we want to look at the aesthetic factors, but we want to take into the consideration everything I mentioned. I like this quote. I read. I got this out of a magazine. Dentists should meet the mouth, the mind of the patient before they meet the mouth. So when it comes to dentures, so we want to talk to the patient, sit them down, and find out what their expectations are. And sometimes you might not be able to meet their expectations with full full, full dentures. You might have to do something like an implant denture, or the standard now is is uh, two two implants on the mandible with an over denture. You know that's that's becoming more and more of the standard on on the, on the mandible. So the preclinical interview. You know, we ask, you know, what are your special concerns or limitations? How long have you been a dentalist? How many dentists have you had since your tooth loss? And how did you lose your teeth? And when was the last time your dentures were relined? You know, many times those dentures, I, I know, I've seen patients, when I had my laboratory, you know, we had, um, we had about eight to 10 dentists in the professional building I was working in. And uh, it was a blessing and a curse because I was called down to the operatory all day long, you know? So uh, we'd have patients come in who have, were wearing, wearing dentures for 15 years and never had them checked. And they needed relines and the occlusion was off. And it really, they had, it was, some of them had really major problems because they, they, they weren't in the, in the dental office to have, be evaluated on a regular basis. So, you know, when was the last time your dentures were relined? How old are the dentures? Um, and have you considered implants? But today we're going to get, you know, that's a whole other seminar on implants. Uh, but uh, today we're going to talk mostly about full upper and full lower dentures. And there's your complete denture checklist. Again, so patients' complaints, history of dentalism, the support they had on, on their dentures. Maybe they didn't have the correct support. Um, I've, seen, I've seen dentures with uh, the patients have been wearing for years, which I can tell right away that the, the borders were, they were never border molded. They never took a, a proper impression. On his, in these on these cases, uh, the, the patient was trimming away the, the uh, periphery, and uh, the support wasn't there. The stability wasn't there. That's going to lead to sore spots, and retention. You know, so we'll talk a little bit more about retention uh, later on when we talk about materials also, and the floor of of the mouth and the tongue room and position. 
we have to look at that also. You know, sometimes that tongue is so so huge on, uh, and, and, uh, and it just trips out that lower denture all the time. Uh, th that lower denture has to be contoured by the laboratory to allow that tongue to rest in there and out, actually act like a retentive element. So this particular ridge analysis and tongue room, look on the left-hand side, the ridge, look at the ridge on the left-hand side of the maxilla, you know, a lot of uh, resorption there, you know, and so a lot of flabby tissue in that area there. So this particular case might be a difficult, difficult case. And, um, you know, we have to look at different aspects, whether maybe the patient needs a soft liner, maybe the patient needs implants or let's see how that, uh, how, what the history was with that patient. And look at the size of the tongue on this case here. I can see that tongue just tripping out that lower denture, you know, so it has to be made accordingly, you know, so uh, and designed the correct way, you know. And I tell this to technicians also when I'm training technicians, you know, you're finishing cases, take into consideration that the patient needs room for the tongue. And we'll mention some of the aesthetic aspects later on, especially on the upper, on the maxilla, on the design and the, um, uh, even with denture teeth on a lingual for better phonetics. So I mentioned earlier, earlier about uh, border molding. We're gonna get into that in a little while, but border extensions are really important on dentures, on full dentures. Uh, we looked at centric relation, VDO, phonetics, aesthetic seclusion, and opposing dentition. If we're not doing a full upper and full lower denture, we're just doing one arch. So a lot of things here to take into consideration when making a denture. And, you know, and if you take into consideration what I'm talking about, you're gonna have a, a successful denture. And you have to communicate this to the laboratory also so they can uh, make that denture accordingly. So, so let's start off with the basics here, some impressions, you know, some essentials for a successful case. So we'll start out with a preliminary impression. You know, so the first impression, you know, if you can get a great, accurate, good, accurate uh, first impression, you know, and capture all those anatomical landmarks, we can make a great custom tray for you that captures all of the anatomical landmarks. So a good preliminary impression is going to lead to a good custom tray and a great final impression. So you can utilize a stock tray and take impressions with a quality alginate material. And uh, we, we can, if, like for instance, this, this particular case here, that's a beautiful preliminary impression. Really captured everything on there. You know, I know some doctors who would probably want to use this as a final model, you know, so, and we've done that in the past. So we want to make sure we capture all those anatomical landmarks and a preliminary impression. And this is one, I'm gonna talk about some products tonight too. And this is one of my favorite products for, especially with, high, with the alginate. This is called the hydrogum material. It's a five day alginate, which lasts about five days in a moist atmosphere. So uh, if you're transporting cases, this works very well. And it's been very accurate for me over the years. You know, that's why I recommend it. So the second visit is gonna be the custom tray impression. And when we're making a, getting a custom tray impression, we want to make sure we're border molding this. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna come back this, to this in a minute, uh, and we you know, I want to talk a little bit about border molding and making the custom tray. But you know when we we're, we're border molding, uh, we want to just capture all that musculature in the mouth, you know, and we want to make sure we're capturing all those anatomical landmarks. And then uh, I'll uh, I'm gonna explain this in a minute here. But uh, when we're making our custom trays, you know, I'm using mostly a, a shellac material or a light cured material. But the light cured custom tray or the custom tray, I'm going to make a couple of millimeters short of, of the periphery. So about two millimeters, three, three millimeters short of the border when I'm doing full dentures. And this is going to allow you to border mold these cases here, which is going to be very important for us. And there's another picture of a two, two to three millimeters short of the border. And should you have tissue shot stops? I like tissue stops on the on uh, the, my full cases. So uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll Put wax uh, wax uh, spacer on the uh, on the ridge or uh, on the uh, on the maxillary on the ridges and on the palate, and I'll put three tissue stops there on the lower, and I'll sometimes I'll put four on the upper, and uh, this will stop you from to putting too much pressure on the uh, on the tissue when you're taking the impression, and it also creates space for that uh, uh, that impression material. So this site, this has three over here. You want to stay away from the papilla. That's pretty close to the papilla there. I stay away from the papilla, so I put tissue stops on each side of the papilla and on the posterior area region where that first molar is. So, uh, and that works out great. And that's gonna create that space for the uh, a good a good impression, good final impression. And I try to block out any undercuts on the model so we have a nice passive fit on those, on those trays. So, you know, the last thing you want in, when you're taking an impression have undercuts where the tray is uh, engaging those undercuts. So you want a nice passive fit on these trays. So, uh, and then some doctors ask for preparations. We make small preparations sometimes with, uh, sometimes with the PVS materials of a lighter body material, it's gonna run out of those preparations. So we wanna be careful the size of the preparations on the tray. 
So a lot of things to take into consideration. And the reason why I put this in there, because over the years I've seen these problems and uh, would like to try to get that information up front with you. So what about border molding? The most successful technique I see, and you know, I used to work for an impression material company uh, years ago, and we did a lot of chair, uh, uh, lunch and learns and chair side support on impression taking. And I think this is one of the most be best techniques that you see here. Just take that custom tray, put a little adhesive on the, on the uh, periphery of the tray, and use a, a monophase or heavy body material around that, uh, that, uh, those, those borders there. Put it in the patient's mouth, have the patient move, move their cheeks, and then you'll have the musculature imp uh, impression of all the anatomical landmarks and muscles in the mouth. Take it out of the mouth, and then you can come over with a medium or a light, lighter body material. So, uh, you know, I like a, like a medium body type of impression material, PBS material. If you're doing a reline, I like more of a lighter body material. So, so some doctors uh, board them all with a compound. Oh, that's fine. If you can, you know, you have a compound to heat up the compound, put it on the, on the borders also. That's, that works also. But I, I tend to like the uh, you know, PBS material and I even have some clinicians using wax on there on the border mold, but uh, I'm all that border molding. So a lot of different techniques, personal, personal preference, they all work fine. And then I, have, I also have some doctors who put uh, some materials in the post dam area too. Uh, and, uh, but I found out over the years when I see these types of cases, when they put some border molding and put some extra material in there, it, you know, and we put a post dam in the laboratory, uh, it's, the retention, retention is not there. It actually pushes the denture out of the mouth. So I recommend not putting that, that uh, border molding material around it where the, uh, the post dam area is. So, this is a, a functional uh, tray with a bite occlusal rim. We talked about this earlier, and uh, this is uh, going to eliminate one visit in the laboratory. So well, basically what we did here, we have a custom tray, and we put a bite uh, occlusal rim on top of the tray. So we're going to board them all this, uh, and then we're gonna take, you're going to take an impression and a bite registration in one visit. That's going to eliminate that, that, uh, that visit for the uh, uh, occlusal, uh, occlusal rim visit. So, and so there's some master models with a functional tray and a functional tray impression. And I'm going to show how this case looks later on when we're doing a denture setup. Yeah, so the precision of transfer, I call it, it's a bite registration using the functional impression with therapeutically designed bite rims. And it's the most reliable way to transfer the oral situation to the articulator. I think it's one of the most accurate ways to, to get that information from you in, in, the, uh, in the operatory to us in the laboratory. So, um, by registration, registration alternatives, I mentioned earlier that you can also use the existing dentures of the patient. Um, that's if the patient, if the dentures are in good shape and the patient hasn't had too many problems with it. If the patient had a, a heck of a time over the years with these, these existing dentures and they just weren't functional, I wouldn't use them. I would just take start from scratch, take a preliminary impression, and we'll make a custom tray. But majority of the time, we get a lot of the impressions with uh, existing dentures. They're border molded, they take a wash impression and a new bite registration, and we can pour those up in the laboratory, mount them right away, and get that dent, those dentures right back to you and get back to the patient. All right, so let's talk about final impressions now and different materials. So, you know, a lot of the dentists get accustomed to uh, the impression materials they used to over the years. You know, there's a lot of different choices out there. You know, so many older materials I see out there, the, you know, the zinc oxide, eugenol, and rubber base, and I still see that once in a while. But I, I, I rececommend the VPS materials uh, or the polyvinyl siloxane materials so uh, uh, to take impressions. So a lot of good materials out there now uh, to take impressions and uh, it should be high quality and better, better accuracy. Examine carefully for accuracy before you send it to the laboratory to make sure you captured all those anatomical landmarks we're going to need for good retention and a successful case. And I mentioned earlier, if a good preliminary impression was taken, chances are that the final impression will be accurate. Use a material that's consistent and accurate when you're taking impressions also. So here you have a picture. This is a nice impression. We've got, we got all the anatomical landmarks here. Not too much border molding on here, but they did capture the periphery on here. So it looks like this is gonna be a good impression. This here, uh, it's kind of an inaccurate impression here. On the anterior region, you have the pressure areas or probable, probable overextension of the tray where you see the blue coming through here uh, and loss of detail from excess saliva and uh, overextension of the border areas, like I mentioned. And this is going to create a problem. If I see a case like this come in the laboratory, I'm going to think of two things. I see those precious points. I see the overextension here on this tray. And I see a real heavy body material that's in this, in this tray. And that's going to compress the tissue. And you might have a problem with fit later on. So 
I'm probably going to get on the phone and uh, plead with the doctor to get, please take a new, a new impression so, uh, and uh, maybe a lighter body impression. I would probably maybe pour this model and trim back the, uh, the overextensions and make a new custom tray for this also. Of course, that's not totally, it's not all the doctor's fault here. I could see the laboratory's fault with his overextension of the tray. So how about this impression, huh? I think they got the, the patient's uh, tonsils and uh, stomach and everything in here. But uh, imagine the patient. We got this. This is an actual impression I got in the laboratory. And I said, man, that poor patient probably was laying back in the chair. The material went all the way down his throat. And look at, I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's, that's, that's crazy. So I had to take a picture of it. You know, so uh, uh, every once in a while we see something like this. But you try to avoid this type of impression because the poor patient is going to suffer. Look at that. Yeah. And plus, look at the anterior region, missing, uh, you know, it wasn't border molded, went through all that trouble, wasn't border molded. And uh, you get the tra overextension of the trays and, you know, and then you have the excess material going down the patient's throat, which is not good. So this is a nice impression here, it captured all the anatomical landmarks, nice, nice full borders. This is going to work out great. This is that functional impression I talked about before. So this is uh, a bite registration and a functional impression taken, uh, taken in, in the operatory. Uh, nice border molding. You know, we used a heavy body material. It got all the anatomical landmarks in here, so it's going to be a successful case. So, and when it comes back to the laboratory, we're going to bead, box, and pour these models so we preserve that all that trouble you went through to give us the uh, the, the nice uh, anatomical borders and musculature. We want to preserve that by box beading and boxing our impression and pouring models. So I know a lot of you are asking, well, what about intraoral scanning for full arches? You know, so it's, uh, and that's been uh, pretty much a hot topic lately, especially with digital dentures. And uh, it can be done, but there's some stipulations and some, I, some restrictions, I would say, in, in taking full arch intra oral scans for your dentalist patients. It's possible, but it's still not perfect. And additional steps must be taken and case selection is critical. So you can use an indelible pencil to help with stitching usage when scanning a particular arch when there are a few landmarks for reference. Uh, but cases with tissue texture and landmarks will be easier to, to scan uh, uh, than, than without. You know, we must make sure to capture all the anatomical landmarks. And some of the problems I've seen with uh, digital scans of fully dental cases, cases were just miss, missing the periphery, we're missing like the hamula knots, the retromolar pads, the lingual side of the lower. It's sometimes hard to get. You know, but there have been successful procedures with uh, with uh, certain certain doctors uh, on taking full uh, fully uh, uh, impressions with uh, intraoral scanning. One of them is Dr. Lavurso. You know, he has an intentionalist scan strategy where he designs for optimal scan experience on intentionalist patients with three shaped trios, and it's all he claims because of the directional uh, uh, impression he takes. He goes in different directions here for a successful case, and he's done this. Uh, efficiently over and over again. As you can see here, you know, on that upper ridge on, on the left-hand side, you know, he, he starts from the, uh, the right side near the, near the hamula knots, goes all, all the way to the left and goes all the way to periphery. And then he go, you know, then he'll go into the palate secondly and take a nice impression. And on the, um, you know, on the lower, he'll start from the retromolar pad, go lingually and go to the other side and go to, on the peripheral side also. So it's, it's a, it's a design and uh, directional, um, technique that he uses for this, um, uh, this, this, the, the successful techniques he's had with intraoral scanning. And this, this article can be found online too, uh, Dr. Lurisso, and uh, you can just uh, uh, Google it and it'll come up, you can read that article. Uh, another uh, research that was done, it was actually February in 2020 in a vivo feasibility study with computerized optical impression taking or intraoral scanning of edentulous jaws, it was on 29 patients. And their conclusion was, Within the limitations of the present study, the investigative scanners were not able to currently fully re replace a conventional impression for the fabrication of a complete denture. So they had some problems. But if you look at the picture, they had actually different, you know, different directions they went when they were taking the impression here. Totally opposite of what the Dr. LaRusso did. So that could have been the issue also, or maybe it was the scanning system they used. But we're seeing more and more successful scans of fully dentalous cases. And I, I think in the next year or so, uh, Hopefully we'll be there. You know, I, I, we've come a long way in the last, just in the last past few years with uh, fully edentulous scans on, uh, uh, with intraoral scanning. So I'm gonna to touch a little bit on the, I like, I like to present a little bit of the uh, laboratory aspect of things too. So you get an idea of what, what we need in the laboratory and what we do to provide you for the best uh, outcome. And, you know, pouring models, especially on denture cases, I like to use a type three stone. 
and like a type three uh, uh, stone is, is better for full cases because when we go to the flasca case, when the case is processed, if you're using a type four stone or a dye stone, uh, it might break the denture. So we want something that's gonna give a little bit when we're deflasking the, uh, the case. So uh, we use a type three stone for full dentures and type four, which is, has a higher uh, compressive strength uh, for partial dentures. Because you're gonna have, when we're making a partial denture, a lot of times there's a lot of wear and tear on the model. On and off, on and off, the partial's going on and off the model. We want something that's gonna hold up to that wear and tear. So that's what we use that type four stone. So we use a vacuum mixer. This is a type three yellow stone that we use for full cases. If for implant cases it's different, I'll use, I will use the type four stone. This is mixing the type four stone. And I use the type four stone, like I mentioned, for partial dentures because it has resistance to abrasion, very low expansion and a high compressive strength. So we have a final impression and now you know, we wanna make a bite registration and occlusal record now. So we wanna make sure we're following the correct, uh, correct protocol. And we depend on so, so much on the information that you give us on the upper uh, occlusal rim when we're setting up denture teeth. You know, we really need that inform information from you. So we, uh, when you're taking these uh, bite registration, you wanna make sure the patient is in an upright position. You don't want it laying down like that impression I showed you before and the material going down the patient's throat. We want to place that contoured occlusal rim and base plate in the mouth and make sure there's no interference or wax or base plate when the patient bites down. And you'll see some, uh, some of the future slides I'm, going to, slides I'm going to show here that to eliminate that problem. And we depend on you marking the midline, the high lip line, and cuspid lines into the wax. And uh, if taking occlusal records for full upper and lower dentures, please place V cuts into the wax in the posterior regions and place some bite registration material between the upper and lower occlusal rims. It's really important. At this point, verify the shade with the patient. You're gonna be taking the shades at this point also. Verify with the patient, have the patient approve it. And if possible, I don't know if you have this in the, in the operatory, but if you have a mold guide, you can choose the mold of the teeth, but we can do that in the laboratory without a problem. So let's talk about making occlusal rims now. We, made, we talked about the uh, preliminary impression, custom tray, occlusal rims, and then we'll get to, uh, we're gonna talk about what we need uh, as far as communication on the occlusal rims also. So, and what you need from us. So we're trying to try to give you in the operatory a good contoured occlusal rim. You know, something that's gonna be functional and something that's got that, you're not gonna spend time cutting away wax or adding wax to. We wanna to try to get to almost where that, uh, that contour should be on these, on these wax rims. So what are the functions of a trial base plate? It aids in the transfer of accurate jaw relationships to the articulator. The base plate simulates a finished dentary base. And that's why we use, utilize these um, uh, light cure materials. They fit really well on the model. And it almost feels to, to the patient like it's the final denture. And it's utilized for occlusal rims and denture setups also. It should be stable and rigid, accurately fitted and adapted to the model and have a proper thickness of about three to four millimeters and clean and smooth and some of the doctors that we do work for request a process base plate, which is something that we will process the actual acrylic that we use to process the denture. And we make a process base plate. And this way the patients can feel, really feel how that final denture is gonna feel like. And then we uh, utilize that in part, as part of the final denture. So let's talk about fabricating the base plate for the bite rim. You know, we, we, I usually draw, I draw a line on a, a mucal buckle fold. I relieve any other undercuts. I apply separating medium and I put, we apply the base plate material and we trim, cure, and finish. We want a good stable base plate, something that's gonna be smooth, something that's, that's gonna be retentive. So when you try in that, that base plate with an occlusal rim, you want that to stay in the mouth, so. And the placement of the occlusal rim should be placed in the anticipated position of the denture tooth setup. And sometimes we'll use a tool called the Amagaze, when I'll show you, show you that in a minute. So we wanna place that, make that occlusal rim. I'm gonna to try to set that about eight to 10 millimeters from the pillar. That's on an average, that's where you're setting denture teeth. And the wax frame must be secured to the base plate so you don't have to worry about that falling away or tearing away from the base plate. Now, and, you know, we try to contour the wax frame to support the lips and the cheeks and give you that exact height that you need on the anterior region. But you know, we don't have the patient with us, so sometimes it is guesswork. So, and we wanna make this look nice and smooth and clean so you have an easy, uh, you know, it's, it's easy for you to take that occlusal record. And, also with the rim function, occlusal rim function, you're going, we're gonna give you, we want to establish lip support. And sometimes we'll might, we might not, not have enough lip support. So we'll depend on you to maybe add some wax to that occlusal rim and occlusal, and also give us that occlusal plane and arch form. So we're gonna record that maxillary mandibular relationship 
You're going to send it back to us at the laboratory. You're going to mark the midline, cuspid line, high lip line, and low lip line. And it's going to make it easier for us in the laboratory to set those denture teeth. So on an average, 22 millimeters from the periphery to the incisal edge on an upper. Closal width is about 8 to 10 millimeters, and the anterior width is about 3 to 5 millimeters on these. That's how we try to contour that for you. And you don't have to worry about it too much in the operatory, but we want, we want to, I just like to get the message across that this is what really, really helps in taking a good bite registration when it's contoured correctly. And even on a lower, an average height from the periphery uh, to the incisal edge is about 18 millimeters, and the same occlusal in the, in, in the anterior width. We try to make that wax rim to cover, cover about two thirds of the height of the rectum ball advance. And there's your finished bases. It's good as a review here. You know, it's nice when we get this information. Sometimes we don't get any information at all. I'm going to show you a setup in a little while that I've done. I did when I didn't get any information at all from the doctor. And at that point, we had to use anatomical landmarks. And we have a, we had a, a bite registration, but we didn't have the midline, canine line, smile lines, and everything else we needed to do a proper setup. So one another great tool, and even in the operatory, this is a great tool. It's a rim former. I'm going to show a short video here. Oh, I, I hope I, you know what, I might have to, um, I might not be able to hear the sound on this. Let me see if this, uh, you know what, I'm going to just get out of here one second so I can show you the next video. Just bear with me one second here. I'm going to see, uh, I'm going to stop share. And share screen here. Here we go. I'm going to share a sound, optimize video clip, and click on that, and share. Okay, good. Here we go. Yeah, I'm getting pretty good at this. Okay, good. All right, so we're going to show a short video here just on the uh, rim former. And hopefully everybody can see. If you can't see this, please let me know. The we can see it, Dennis. Tool that facilitates okay, the fabrication of wax rims in a laboratory. It could also be used clinically to adjust the rim during the wax rim try-in appointment. The rim former has a five millimeter fence on either end and a wax spillway in the center. The tool has been designed so they can be used either by a right or left-handed person. We're going to try in the wax rims and have the patient relax his lips. Uh, typically, I like to have the patient count 1 to 10 uh, or to have them converse in a casual conversation so that we can evaluate the incisal length of the wax rim. Two, three, I think we could agree that the rim is too long for our patient, so I will mark where I think the rim should end and we will adjust the wax to the desired length. The rim former is heated over a flame and the five millimeter fence is positioned over the uh, hamler notch area of the denture base. The rim former is slowly brought forward, melting the wax up to the designated mark. Note how the melted wax is automatically guided through the center spillway. So you see how easy that is. I mean, it, it gives you a really good uh, accurate account of how, how high that, uh, that uh, wax rim should be. And we use something also in a laboratory called an AMA gauge. And I mentioned earlier, on an average, when you're setting denture teeth, it's about eight to 10 millimeters from the papilla. And this AMA gauge, we have a pin, a needle that goes in the papilla. And you can see the measurement of the wax rim is about eight millimeters from the papilla. So we like to use this tool also when we're doing setups. So it's another interesting tool. And this, this uh, actually, uh, Ibuclar sells this tool also. So and there's your contoured wax rim. So let's talk about taking the back right, bite registration now with these wax rims. So uh, another way, uh, it, it, there's some tools out there. This is called a callback te template. This gives you the exact thickness on the, uh, on the wax rim also on the posterior and anterior region. And it also gives you the, uh, the height that you need. So you can see here, it, this is uh, uh, 18 millimeters on the lower from the periphery to the incisal edge. And, um, and that's how you do the same thing. It has a 22 millimeter mark also. And when you put this on the model, you stick your Bard Parker blade or a blade right through those slots there with, with the 10 and with the 22 and 18 millimeters. So this is a great little tool also called the callback call technique. So how about this by registration? How do you like that one, huh? <laughs> this is an actual case I received uh, a number of years ago and the doctor wanted me to go, uh, it was an immediate denture. 
Doctor wanted me to go to a finish, and I had I, I, I tried to put the opposing model against the upper, and it just wouldn't fit together. I said, "What what was used? What kind of wax was this? It was like an alu wax, beeswax combination, and it was a it was a joke. I mean, it really was, and and uh, the impression wasn't that great, and I, there was no way I was going to go to a finish. So I called the doctor, and guess what the doctor told me." Do the best you can, Dennis. <laughs> so I was ready to pull my hair out. So I said, doctor, I can't do the best we can. We need a, a new impression and then we have to make a buy registration. And that's what we did and the case turned out great. So uh, once in a while we get cases like that. So, uh, and then I can rip my hair out when I get them. But anyway, we wanna get the patient in a, cust uh, a comfortable position uh, and we call it the physiological rest position. You look, how th look how this patient is struggling here on the left-hand side, just trying to get into their rest position. She's trying to lay back and she puts her head up a little bit and, and she just can't get there. And finally, she's gotten there into centric occlusion, but it's still a struggle. So we wanna eliminate that. We wanna get the patient in a nice comfortable position so we can replicate that bite over and over again. And then when the occlusal rim is in the mouth, we have to say different things, the, the F sounds and, and count to 10 and make sure we have enough height on, these air, on the anterior region. And also we want a good plane of occlusion. And some of these photos you're going to see here, they're old photos, uh, but they, they, I just want to get the message across them, the correct way to, uh, to, to take a by registration, especially on the, uh, on the upper. So this doctor is marking the midline and the, cut and the smile line and the high lip line. This is the information we'd love to get uh, on, on an occlusal rim. And you can also maneuver at the lip line. You can build out the wax to, to build out the lip if you need to add wax to it. You can control the angle of the mouth by adding wax or taking away the mouth wax. And we get this quite a bit. The doctor might add a little bit of wax on the incisal so I know exactly where the incisal edge on the interior is going to wind up when we set up our denture teeth. So this is a, just a couple of photos here. You know, this is a, um, a, a ruler from the tip of the nose to the middle of the ear. And then you know, this is called the campus plane and it's equal to the occlusal plane. But look how that uh, when the, the uh, doctor has that uh, occlusal instrument in the mouth on the, on the wax, and you see it's sloping down. Uh, we need to cut back that posterior region of the wax. You know, otherwise we're going to set up these teeth. It's going to be a reverse smile, and the patient's probably not going to be able to bite down correctly. So um, we cut that back, put it back in the mouth. You see that upper right picture here? Look how nice. So the campus plane is equal to the occlusal plane, and now we have that bite, bite plane nice and even. With the, uh, with the campus plane. So now we're in good shape and the doctor can take a good accurate uh, bite registration. Another great tool is the papillometer. This is gonna give us an idea of where that incisal edge is gonna wind up. And this is a great little tool. I love to get the information uh, on, from the papillometer. Actually, I like that information actually before we even make the bite rim. The final tray, custom tray impression. If you can give me a papillometer reading, then I can probably give you a better contoured um, uh, bite, uh, occlusal rim. And it's this, as you can see this picture here, it's about 17 millimeters from the where the lip ends here. And it's placed on a papilla. And we're probably gonna add a few more millimeters to show some teeth there. So I have a little short video here you can watch on this particular uh, uh, tool. It's called a papillometer. Great tool. First thing I want to do is open up mic, please. And we're gonna take the patient's uh, denture out. And I'm going to take the uh, papillometer as a, a, a device that's going to help us uh, give the, the uh, lip line uh, communication to the laboratory. And it has a little device in the back of here that's going to rest against the anterior papilla. And where this meets the gauge here, that would be at the zero point. In other words, where it rests on the incisal papilla, there'll be our zero point. And when we press this into the patient's mouth, whatever reading we get here, will be interpreted as a number of millimeters between the patient's anterior papilla and the patient's lip as it's recorded. Now we're gonna to go to the patient and I'm gonna put this uh, gently under Mike's lip here. And again, resting this against the, the patient's anterior papilla, we're gonna let the lip just very gently and gracefully uh, assume its resting position. And as I look at that, uh, from my position here, I'm going to measure that at about 14 millimeters. Now I'm going to ask Mike to, um, that's going to be the patient's low lip line. And I'm going to ask Mike to give it a, a nice casual smile. Now we're about nine millimeters. We're going to consider that as our patient's high lip line. So we got a difference between low lip line, high lip line of five millimeters plus. And uh, give, give me a little more of a smile, Mike. 
Yeah, maybe I, maybe I'll put that measurement around eight millimeters. First, we're going to mark a dot right here. Yeah, so you don't have to look at the leprosy tree. I just wanted to show you that because it's a little long with the video here. But you can see that, you know, uh, he uses it for the high lip line and uh, low lip line. Uh, you can also use it for the uh, the incisal edge for also in the information. So you can give us all those three, inf uh, three information pieces of information to give you the nice contoured vibrant. And we want to make sure that plane of occlusion is correct also. Another important aspect of it is securing the by registration together. Like I mentioned before, you have an upper and lower denture, cut a uh, wax rim, cut those V cuts in there, use a good, good by registration material to secure it. Even some good uh, uh, strong wax would, would, would suffice, but make sure that goes together because sometimes we'll have problems in the laboratory with the by registration moving during transport. And this is some of the pictures. I have some old photos here. Uh, the way the cases used to come to the laboratory with, with staplers in there, staples in there, and the case would be moving around like crazy. We'd have to you know, get get uh, get it in the right position, you know. So we don't want that. So again, this is an example of the V cuts in there, and you want to put some wax maybe in between there, like you see here, and just to, so you have that stability. You know, you went through all the trouble of taking a good uh, closure record. Make sure it's secure when you send it to us at the laboratory. And I'm going to just touch on this for uh, baseball transfers. And a lot of people get uh, get afraid of baseball transfers and they get nervous. But uh, when we're doing full mouth rehabilitation and full, full mouth reconstruction, uh, I'd love to get a baseball transfer. And, and it's, it has been difficult in the past, but um, I use an articulating system called Artex, and it really works well. And you can see I was the guinea pig on this picture. This is me in the, uh, a few years back here. Uh, that's when my hair was dark. But uh, uh, talking about a Facebook transfer, um, I took some photos uh, utilizing this, the Artex material, uh, Artex articulator in Facebook. So it comes with a 3D universal joint, it comes with bite forks uh, and uh, everything you need, a baseball frame and an Asian bar. But we don't have to, you don't have to send the whole baseball to the laboratory. You know, that's, that's what makes it unique. So what are we looking for in a baseball function? We want to register the patient's maxillary hinge access relationship. And it's reference to correctly positioned cast on an articulator. Could be any articulator. Uh, and ensures that the restoration of denture is made to the exact cranium access relationship of the patient. So the first thing we're doing is taking uh, upper and lower uh, by, by registration. We're going to put V cuts in there in the upper and lower. And we're going to take a, an occlusal rest, uh, registration with the upper and lower. And then we're going to spread some PBS material on the, uh, on the bite fork and try to position that upper uh, occlusal rim in there. And then we're going to position the, position the bite fork and put that, put it onto the universal joint of the face bow. Okay, once that face bow is taken, all you have to do is detach that little piece, that universal joint, and we have something called a transfer stand. And uh, so you, you keep the face bow, you attach this to the transfer stand, as you see on the right-hand side here, the magnetic, the magnetic stand, and you can use plaster or putty to attach, attach it to the stand. And you can see I, I attached it with putty over here. And this whole stand will come back to us at the laboratory, to the laboratory, and, uh, and what we'll do is we'll mount it on an articulator. We move the, you know, we have the transfer table with the bite fork and the transfer stand. So that comes back to us. All we, all we need is the bite fork and the transfer stand. And we position this uh, on the lower half of the articulator. And then we put the, we mount our upper model. And then we place the lower model against the upper model with the V cuts they originally got on the initial bite. And then we mount the upper, uh, upper and lower model. And now we have our face bow transfer. It's almost like having a patient at the bench with us. So this is a very easy procedure with uh, Artex. And I love this Facebook transfer, especially for full mouth, especially with implant cases and full mouth reconstruction. Uh, I like to have a Facebook transfer, you know, so, uh, and it correctly, you know, positions that uh, upper and lower model on the articulator and mimics exactly the hinge access relationship of the patient. So let's, let's talk about articulators and articulations now. So. Most of the time, you know, I'd like to use a semi-adjustable, a fully adjustable articulator, but that's not feasible at times, but at least a semi-adjustable is something that I like for a full upper and lower model uh, by registration. So we're gonna talk about different articulators. There's a lot of different articulators out there. We have a straight hinge, semi-adjustable, fully adjustable. This is your straight hinge articulator. Really doesn't mimic true jaw relationships. We want something that's gonna have, you know, uh, if you, especially with, uh, if you have a really, in, in, a detailed case for a full upper and full lower difficult patient, you know, we want something that's going to be uh, mimic true jaw function, you know, and they have magnetic articulators out there to transfer from one to the other. Um, and we want to make sure that you're able to transfer and calibrate it with each other. So a lot of times what we'll do is 
We'll take our, um, our fully adjustable articulator or semi-adjustable articulator. We'll calibrate it with your articulator in the office. And all you have to do is send us the magnetic uh, mounts on, and we can, we, you know, we don't need everything. So, and then you have our plastolis articulator too for checking and quality control on, on a bite registration. These are just some articulators that are out there. This, this is a semi-adjustable articulator from a company called Yamahachi. It uh, works out really well. It's transferable from one to the other. And then uh, you know, we have your uh, fully adjustable articulators that you can range anywhere from $500 to, uh, to $2,000 on these articulators and, and more. So, uh, but something that's gonna really mimic draw, true draw relationship on the patient. So let's talk about at mounting on an average value or semi-adjustable articulator. You wanna make sure the occlusal plane is aligned in the marked occlusal plane of the articulator. And the center of the model is identical to that of the articulator. So we wanna make sure the occlusal plane is exact. And most of these, most of these semi-adjustable and fully adjustable articulators have slots on the, uh, the incisal guide pin on, in the posterior region of the articulator. Many times I'll put a, a rubber band around it so I can get the right occlusal plane. You can see how nicely this is gonna be mounted here. I'm following the occlusal plane of the patient here. And we have a, the exact relationship of the patient uh, and uh, the information that was given to us by the clinician. And here it shows the stentor teeth was set up. This is the lower setup. And there's your upper setup with the occlusal plane and the incisal edges and uh, then and, and following the guideline of the upper bite room. And then we just wax it for finish. So what we try to do here is just envision the patient uh, at, at the bench here. So we have a pupil line, which is equal to the occlusal plane. We're coming up half the height of two thirds of the retromolar pad for our second molars when we're setting our denture teeth. As you can see here, there's a occlusal rim. And then we have our campus plane from the tip of the nose to the middle of the ear, that's your occlusal plane. So we try to visualize this when we're setting up denture teeth, because like I mentioned earlier, we have all this intraocclusal space we have to fill. And we really need to know the information while we're doing this. And we count on anatomical landmarks and the information you give us. And just look what happens when this when uh, models aren't trimmed correctly. Sometimes I, you know, I see a lot of this uh, when these cases are mounted on a semi-adjustable or even a regular articulated, and it throws us off at the laboratory. It really could get you know uh, the wrong type of a, uh, a setup when we have information like this. So uh, this particular case, we had to put um, bases on the model so we can even out the occlusal plane. So it's important we get the right occlusal plane. And let's just as a review, you have your Frankfurt horizontal plane and the campus plane and the occlusal plane, one, two, and three. And this is correlating it with the articulator and with the denture. So some good information here, probably a review for a lot of you. So, you know, on the average dimensions, when you're setting up denture teeth, like I mentioned earlier, from the periphery, 20 to, 20 to 22 millimeters, the incisal edge on the upper and 18 to 20 on the lower. So, and then, Talk about digital technology. The new digital technology now we have actually have virtual articulators. So when we're making a digital denture, everything's done. For, we have the correct information from uh, from the clinician. We can apply this with a digital articulation, and our denture setup part is done uh, pretty quickly uh, compared to the traditional way. I just wanted to tease you a little bit some, with some digital technology. We'll talk about that another time. So, so let's get into, let's see how our time is going here. Six thirty. Okay, we're, we're good. We're doing well. We have a little while to go. I want to talk about the tooth setup and wax trying now. So uh, this is really important. I talk about occlusion and the right materials. So it's time to do a few setups here. So uh, let's talk about the correct way to do a setup, using the correct denture teeth. There's a lot of choices out there for denture teeth. Let me tell you, this it must be, you know, dozens and dozens of companies out there, maybe 50 to maybe 100 companies selling denture teeth, but I like to use a good quality tooth. And that's what we utilize at, uh, at uh, DSG. Even with our, um, I don't like to, I, I would call them like the, the, um, maybe our economy denture or economy plus denture or something, a more traditional denture. We still use high end, uh, good, good, uh, uh, good teeth, good quality teeth, something that's gonna wear almost like natural dentition and something that's gonna have good aesthetics. So what are we looking for in the, in the denture teeth and denture teeth? We want something the same size as natural teeth, something with high wear resistance, lingual anatomy for better phonetics. So I like to have that lingual anatomy on these anterior teeth so it, it patient speaks better because I've noticed over the years when, especially with new denture patients, their tongues tends to slide off the lingual of the uh, anterior teeth and they lisp and it takes a while to get for them to get used to it. So I try to use a tooth that has, uh, you know, 
encompasses bleach shades, 3D shades, and, and classic shades. And uh, one of my favorite teeth are Vita, Vita uh, teeth. So, um, and uh, that cover all that encompasses all the criteria. So, uh, but there are other brands of teeth that we use also that also we can do comparisons with the different shades. Look at the lingual anatomy on these teeth here. You know, this is going to help the patient. We have natural rugae in, in the palatal area. Looks great. Patient's going to have a nice uh, you know, phonetics when the patient speaks. It's going to be easier for that patient to get accustomed to these dentures. So we want a functional cuspal inclination of about 20 to 33 degrees. We want the patient to chew and tear that food. You know, so you know, I see a lot of laboratories, you know, uh, as, as I was training over the years, they're using zero degree teeth or five degree teeth. You know, it, it's not a tooth that's going to really help that patient chew and tear their food. So uh, we want something that has better tearing and chewing capabilities and a wider occlusal plane, especially for partial dentures. And the Merton's profiles that's going to look natural for the patient. You know, I mentioned earlier, you know, the patient doesn't want to look like they're wearing a denture. They want to look, they want to look natural. So how do we select anterior teeth? Well, we have a couple of ways to select anterior teeth. If you look at the uh, full upper arch, and yes, I, I hold up the model and I look at the upper arch, it looks like a central. So all these years, when I, when I pick out my anterior teeth, I look at the upper arch and I say, you know, is this an, uh, a tapering ovoid arch? Is it a square arch? If there's a square arch, I'm going to go with a square, a square tooth and so on. So I look at the shape of the arch and pick out the shape of my centrals. And if we have a study model, we can utilize that to follow the guidelines of the study model. And or you can use the, um, uh, the occlusal rim and measure from cuspid to cuspid line on the occlusal rim, rim with a millimeter ruler. And I'll help you go to the tooth, tooth chart and pick out the correct teeth. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways. And tooth form equal facial forms. You know, if you have a square face, most of the time you're going to have a square central, square tapering, square tapering central, and so on. These are some old slides too I like to show, just to show the correlation between facial form and tooth form. And then we have anatomical, natural anatomical landmarks also. The tips of the canines usually equal to the width of the nose. And the width of the centrals are usually equal to the width of the filtrum. And breaking, uh, breaking that, uh, the, the face into different parts here, you know, this helps us to, you know, with digital photos. And we have our pupil line with this is equal to the occlusal plane, our midline. We have a, a smile line down there, and then we have a cuspid line. So we break this in, into different sections. And I like to do this, especially with the digital photos when we, come, we get this in the lab, because I get to, it gives me a better idea of how to set those anterior teeth. So I'm going to touch on setting some denture teeth now, and I think this is important. You know, I would, we want uh, harmonious and aesthetic results when we're setting denture teeth. And I'm going to talk about a couple of different scenarios when we're setting denture teeth in the laboratory. So the anteriors are positioned individually and parallel to the pupil line. Yeah, I mentioned that a lot, that pupil line is very important. The lower incisal edges are parallel to the upper incisal edges. So um, a lot of different techniques in setting denture teeth. This is what I've been successful over the years with. I'm going to show you my technique in a minute. And I always tell uh, you know, technicians or even the, pro the prosthodontists I work with, a lot of the prosthodontists want to set their own teeth and we share the same uh, vision. And we, we mark the crest of the ridge. Uh, we want to make sure we don't deviate from setting those posterior teeth off the bridge, crest of the ridge. Otherwise, it's not going to be a stable denture. I, I, draw my, I circle my papilla here. So I'm coming out about eight to 10 millimeters from the papilla. And I want to make sure I have all my anatomical landmarks here uh, drawn out, especially with people who are just starting to set up dentures. I like to draw these uh, features on the model. So this is a case where I didn't have any information on the occlusal rim. So I went with 40 millimeters in, uh, in intraocclusal space, which, uh, you know, which was pretty close to what the doctor had given me. And uh, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to follow anatomical landmarks. And I'm going to use an alma gauge to set the anterior teeth. So I have my base plate. And you know, I'm gonna, you have to be careful because I see a lot of people setting teeth uh, uh, and they set teeth right on the ridge. But if you look on the bottom here, if you have maximum ridge absorption and you're setting teeth right on the ridge here, that patient is gonna be sunken in, it's not gonna look natural. So this is why like with minimum ridge resorption, I'll come out about eight to 10 millimeters from that pupilla. So I take my alma gauge, I'm gonna set my first, my centrals. I'm gonna come about eight to 10 millimeters from the pupilla, set my first centrals. I place them at the correct inclination. Then I place my laterals at the correct inclination. And then I take my occlusal plate. I'm gonna have my centrals and my cuspids touching that occlusal plate. And I'll have my laterals right off the plate there. I want that one millimeter space between the, uh, the laterals off that plate. And at this point, I'm gonna check for symmetrical arrangements of the anteriors and I'm ready to set my lowers. So as you can see here, my centrals and my canines are on the plate and the laterals off the plate, but one millimeter. So, 
Then I'm gonna set my lower central as allowing about one million radio of vertical and horizontal overlap. And this is gonna, you know, I, I like to do it this way because it's, especially for newer denture patients, you know, I don't want that tight relationship on the anterior because many times I'll be tripping their dentures and I don't want that to happen. So I'm gonna set my lo an lower anterior teeth that's follow the guidelines you know, of the upper. So I have up my upper anterior and my lower anterior teeth set. Now, let's go back to this case here real quickly. This is that functional impression that was case taken earlier. And we poured a model and we had the bite registration, every, everything's articulated correctly, but we can't utilize these original base plates because it's gonna to be too loose. So, but I wanna maintain the information that the dentist gave me on this bite occlusal rim. So I take a little putty matrix and I put a midline and I put my cuspid lines in there and I know exactly where those anterior teeth are gonna wind up. So I take that occlusal rim off, I make a base plate and I can set my anterior teeth to the, right, to the, right to where I need it to be. So there's your putty index and I'm setting those anterior teeth and I follow the guidelines of that putty index and I go through the same procedure I did with that previous case. I set my lowers to the guidelines of the uppers and we go up, I go up from there and get ready to set our posterior teeth. So guidelines of setting, selecting posterior teeth. We have to figure out what kind of occlusal scheme. You know, many patients can't tolerate a high occlusal scheme or a high cuspal inclination like a, a 33 degree teeth, but tooth. So in that instance, I might go down to a 10 degree or a 15 degree tooth. But, you know, we want something that's semi-anatomical or anatomical, definitely so. Uh, and we have to take into considerations the classifications of bites. You know, yeah, it's great if we get a normal bite every time we do a denture, but a lot of times we don't. We get cross bites, we get class two bites where the mandible is retruded, and we get class three bites where the you know, mandible is forward than the maxillary. In this instance, this is the only time I would probably use a five degree or a zero degree tooth on a posterior region. So it's this way the patient can maneuver a little bit easily, go through the different excursions a little bit easier also. So these are your different, you know, in, uh, occlusal schemes here, monoplane, which I'm not crazy about. Lingualized occlusion, when we have this lingual cusp of the upper going to the central fossa of the lower, this is gonna relieve any off-axis stress on the ridge. And any implant case that I, I do or set up or uh, process, it's with lingualized occlusion. Of course, it's relieving any off-axis stress on the implant. So it's a great occlusal scheme even for full dentures. So there's a combination uh, occlusal schemes also right here. So, so at different degrees of teeth, typically the smaller the ridge, the less degree of tooth and the greater the ridge, greater the degrees. I'm not saying this is in all cases, but typically that's the way it is. We have a higher cuspal inclination when the ridge is a larger ridge on the patient. So we're ready to set our posterior teeth. And I just, I, I drew my lines. I, I went half to two thirds of the hydrodestrovola pad and I want to align the occlusal surfaces towards the center of the cranium, as you see here. That's my Kerber Wilson. On the right hand side, I don't have that Kerber Wilson because uh, the only time I don't have that Kerber Wilson is when I'm, I'm doing a lingualized occlusion because I want those forces to come straight down in the central fossa of the lower teeth. So the actual inclination of the posterior is the center to the cranium, as you can see here. And then I just want to check our list here, make sure the central fossa of the teeth are on a lower ridge. Make sure a vertical inclination of the posterior teeth are there. Curve of Wilson, and you check, check, your, check your curve of speed from the anterior to the posterior. Let's do a little review here. We've got the curve of Wilson from buccal to lingual, and curve of speed from anterior to posterior. So, so now I'm setting my posterior teeth here. I'm setting my first bicuspid uh, on the upper, and I use my occlusal plate to verify contact on the occlusal plate. I'll set my lower bicuspid, I make sure it's interdigitated. I'll do the second, when I do my second bicuspid and I'll do on the upper and then on the lower. I'll go upper, lower, upper, lower. And then when I set, get to my first molar on the upper, I am going to have contact on a mesial cusp on the upper and I'm gonna leave that distal cusp off the occlusal plate here. And this is gonna start giving me my curve of speed. And you can see the second molar, I don't have any contact at all. Now they do have special templates for setting these denture teeth. I've just been successful with this method all these years. I got used to it and I really had some great results. So this is how I set my upper and lower posterior teeth. At this point, I can adjust these teeth now. I have my template too. I'm just take testing and checking the alignment of everything, the height, height of contour. And then if there's any interference, I wanna check my working and balancing now and go into, into different excursions. So. And this is that plate I showed you before, that Colbeck plate. This is also, you can verify the height of contour on these the denture teeth to make sure they're set correctly. So there's the final wax up. This is, every, this is after the uh, final wax up, ready for trying. So everything's set up there, very nice, looks, everything's great. Uh, and we were able to do a setup on this case very nicely. So 
everything's harmonious. It's, it's a nice harmonious transition to the posterior. So it's an individualized setup and something that's going to be aesthetic and functional. So real quickly, there's another template. There's another te technique called the template technique. And what we use is the Artex articulator and the template. And I do everything I, was, I did before. I expose the papilla on this one though, because I want to I want to use the alma gauge. Doing the same thing, I have 40 millimeters into occlusal space. I set my upper six anteriors, check the arrangement on the occlusal plate. And then, like I mentioned before, central and canine touching the plate. I set my lower anteriors. Now what I'll do, I am, you know, instead of setting my uppers and lowers, now I'm going to set the rest of my lowers. And, and by that, I'm going to put this template on the upper part of the articulator. I'm going to set my posterior teeth on a lower right against that template. It's going to give me my curve of Wilson, my curve of speed. And I look, this is a great method. It really works well. And it's all, it's, it's from cuspal inclinations from zero to 35 degrees. So I set all my teeth against the template and then I'm ready to set my upper teeth. You have the contact there on the cusps, buccal and lingual cusps, my Kerber Wilson, Kerber Spee. Lower teeth, teeth are on the central, central uh, fossa of the ridge. Uh, you got central of the ridge. We have that, uh, make sure that uh, it's set collect correctly on the ridge. Then I set my upper posteriors against the lowers and we're set to go. So I probably saved half the time I did in my previous setup with, by using a template. So this works out really well. I like to just show some of the different techniques out there. And there's the final wax up for trying. This particular wax up on this case here, the doctor wanted me to, to mimic the uh, gingiva in the trion. So you can see I got a little crazy with the characterization points here. And I actually put some nice characterization in there. So, and to, just to teach you a little bit more with digital setups here, it's so much you could do. They have full arch setups with digital technology. You can see you can bring the teeth into occlusion on a digital setup. You don't have to go through everything I showed you. You can widen the teeth if you wanted to, the occlusal, the occlusal of the teeth. A lot of things you could do with the new digital, digital dentures here. So, oh, I'm getting running out of time here. So. so let's go. You saw the wax for trying, it's been color waxes. I like to contour it and it makes it look, look natural. Which one you prefer, the one on the left or the right? So I would like to prefer the one on the right here. So there's your final uh, wax up and there's your trying. So, I want to touch on denture bases while we have a little time here. Uh, what are we looking in a denture base? We want something with natural look. We want something with high impact resistance and flexural strength and good finishing and polishing properties. So this is important when you're looking at a denture base. There's a lot out there uh, to choose from. You know, if the dense fly, you have the Keystone, you have Diamond D. There's a lot of different uh, systems out there that process these types of cases. I think the most accurate way to process a case is with the uh, injection system. I'm showing the Iva base here. You have constant pressure on the model at all times when you're processing, so you have a good, accurate uh, model, uh, good, good, accurate denture. Here's conventional investing and packing, still widely used in the industry. These are some dentures that I did uh, just to show the various types of uh, gingival effect on them. And then you can utilize denture-based staining, like I mentioned before. And what we do with this, we just take the, uh, uh, the denture and we roughen it up after it's cured. We have a digital photo of what the denture should look like or matching the patient's ginger, gingiva. I'll apply a different, different uh, pastes on there. These sets just happen to be a light cured material. And I keep layering it till I achieve the uh, proper color and I can match the patient's gingiva. And you can see this is it and we polish it and this is the final outcome of this. And then you saw this one before, this is another denture based uh, staining um, scenario. And then, so the fifth visit, everything's good. You, everything's processed. You're going to check for fit, form, and function. Check for pressure spots and equilibrate the occlusion if necessary. Uh, we try to do that for you in the laboratory. After the case is, is processed, we put it back on, on the articulator. We, we bring it into the, the proper occlusion. Sometimes if they, we have some occlusal error, maybe a, a little touch on uh, grinding on one tooth or another to bring it back into, uh, into proper occlusion. We, and it doesn't happen all, often, but we do that. We do check that for you. So he has last chair time. So this is how a fit should look. Close, open, close, tap, tap, tap. Stay closed. And then move your jaw side to side. Nice retention. He's going back and forth. That lower staying in place. Just relax. Open up. Bite down. Tap, tap, tap. Again, move your jaw side to side. Watch when it actually tries to take you out of the mouth, the retention. And just relax. 
Retention to the lower. Actually, have suction on the lower end. Very this one. good. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Retention Much to the upper that upper, trying to get that upper out of there. So, but these are the fits I get with, with traditional dentures. Yeah, but I wanted to just give you a, a, a I'm teasing you here because these are actual traditional dentures. The, they're a process. Look at the, the results. Look at the results. So, but we get to, we get the like, we get some great fit on our uh, traditional dent, traditional dentures also. There's another case that you saw that characterized dentures you saw before. This is how it looked in the mouth here. So, and then I'm not going to get into polishing, but if you polishing in the, in the operatory and you have the policies, this is a great kit. It's called the Hato kit. It cuts your time in half with polishing. I'm not a big fan of polishing. I, I never liked it, but it's a necessary evil. This is a great kit to, to utilize. And this is a a great brush, Palatino brush that gets into scratches in the uh, in the palatal area if you need to polish that also in the operatory. So artistry through denture technology. We covered a lot of information today. I know it, I, I go fast sometimes and I try to squeeze everything in there, but I wanted to show you the successful techniques on, on these dentures. So excellence in denture technology, the combination of communication, the right materials, and the expertise and the science behind what we're doing in an appropriate way and a successful way is gonna yield to patient satisfaction. So with that, I want to thank everybody for being with us tonight. And I'm going to open it up to questions if we have some time. But thank you so much. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dennis, for your wealth of information and sharing with us this evening. Uh, the Q&A button is open and the chat box is open if you have any questions. Um, also, we will repost uh, Dennis's information uh, Chrissy's information and Mark's information so you can have that to reference and reach out them to them later should you need to. Um, and I'm doing that right now. You've got a great information. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, very informative. Thank you. Um, but no questions, no questions coming all. in. I want yeah. one question. One question, please. <laughs> no, I overloaded them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. And Dennis is always available um, as a resource. He's D Urban at dentalservices.net. And again, my name is Jessica Respondek with DSG Education. I thank you for attending. I wish you a good night. And I turn it over to Dennis to close in his positively positive way. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. And hope you had an all, all had a positive learning experience tonight. And may you apply your knowledge and expertise in a positive way, in a way that will enhance your careers and your self-worth. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be here tonight. And I thank you so much. Have a great day. Appreciate it.